Um, I'll be talking today about what mold, mildew, and microbial life have to tell us about Jewish cultural heritage. Um, and to do that, I'll be looking at a couple of passages from a novel called Zelman Yonner uh, by Moshe Kolbach. Oops. So this is a novel that was serialized between 1929 and 1936 in Belarus, which at the time was part of the Soviet Union. Um, and Zelman Yonner is the story of a multi-generational Jewish family that lives together in a cluster of crumbling houses on the outskirts of Minsk. Um, and it's a really wonderful novel for anyone who wants to understand the way that Eastern European Yiddish speaking Jews ended up becoming integrated into the Soviet project. Uh, the book itself is a series of vignettes that portray how different family members uh, negotiated their connections to Jewish communal life, to religion, um, as well as their experiences of Sovietization. And because of the way that this novel is thinking about transition and change, it pays a lot of attention to the way that the changes that accompany Soviet industrial and economic, economic initiatives also transform the ecological landscape that these characters are living in. So how do Soviet agricultural policies uh, shift the way that land is being used in Belarus? Or how does electric light restructure the way that people experience public and private space? Um, and there's a lot that can be said about the way that Zelman Yonner is thinking about ecology on the macro level. But one of the things that has always struck me about this novel is the way that it treats microbial life. Uh, and what makes that particularly interesting to us as people who study Yiddish and Yiddish literature is that these microbial life forms enter into Kulbach's text by way of other Yiddish texts. Um, and I'll explain by what I, what I mean by that in a moment. Um, so I wanna look at a couple of narrative instances that can help us understand what microbiology is doing for this book. Uh, but first there's one character who we need to contextualize a little bit. So the two scenes that I'm gonna be looking at uh, both concern a man named Salka, who is a member of the younger generation of this Belarusian Jewish family. Um, he's supposed to be around 26 years old uh, and he functions kind of as the family's amateur ethnographer or historian or archivist. Uh, he's someone who has spent his adolescence and his early adulthood in a world where the pre-Russian revolution Jewish tradition has already ceased to exist, but he has an intense curiosity about that culture and how it impacted the family that he was born into. Uh, there's one description of Tzalka that captures this really well, quote, if you ever see someone hanging by the shelf near the ceiling where the trinas are rotting away, it's Uncle Yudah's son, Tzalka. So trinas, for those who don't know, are Yiddish language prayers or blessings that are historically uh, recited by Jewish women. Uh, and these are the books or pages that are described as rotting away on the top shelves of this bookcase. Uh, and here the Yiddish is particularly interesting. The word that Kulbach uses, uh, describes the process of wood that's starting to decay after it's been colonized by fungus. And it's a really wonderful word that captures the materiality of these trinas, the fact that they have been abandoned by the women who originally owned them, and that when they're rediscovered by Tzolka, they've been transformed by these fungi that are causing the paper they've written on to disintegrate. And in his quest to unearth family history, Tzolka ends up shining new light on these trinas, uh, bringing them into a new context where they become the objects of his own ethnographic inquiry. But what's really critical here for me is that he's encountering them after they've become home to a fungus that determine how this material inheritance looks and feels and smells. It's not just the trinus that he's finding, it's this hybrid that's created through the interdependency of cultural heritage and written media and microbial life forms. So let's move on to a couple other quotes. Uh, each time Salka is introduced as a character, he's typically framed as someone who stands out from the rest of his family and from his peers because of the interest he takes in these dusty Jewish books. For example, here's a quote from chapter six. Uh, quote, Salka would sometimes bring with him a kab hayosher at night, stealing away silent in his room and hungry with a strange fire in his eyes, staying up until morning. So the Kav Yosher is a book that was published in Hebrew in the 18th century, but it very quickly became wildly popular with Jews across Europe uh, and was often published in many editions with an accompanying uh, Yiddish translation. Um, the Kav Yosher was part of the early uh, Musar movement, which was focused on ethical guidance and Jewish moral behavior, but it also drew on the Kabbalah and on elements of Jewish mysticism. And like the Trinus that we were just talking about, Tzolka's copy of this book is home to its own colonies of mildew and mold. Quote, he would run his fingers over the thick greenish pages, taking pleasure from letters, words, and verses, which the average person could hardly understand. 
So this is a book that has gone from being one of the most widely read volumes among Ashkenazi Jewish families to one which has turned sickly, musty, and overgrown with greenish mold. And in going through that metamorphosis, it's taken on these new mystical qualities. It's gone from being a work of popular religious literature in plain language to something esoteric and mysterious. And the mystery that it's shrouded in is partly due to the overgrowth of fungi, which lets us know that this is a book that's ancient and full of life, but also in a way that might be unsettling for the senses. This kind of solitary, old fashioned, sort of detached intellectualism that we see with Salka is contracted with his cousin Falka, who he shares a bedroom with. Uh, in the next paragraph, we're told that, quote, at the same time, Falco would be sprawled on the bed in the next room, the blanket kicked away, and through his chronically congested nose, he would whistle melodies in his dreams, dreaming of laying roofs on houses in Leningrad or running electricity across the Dnipro River. So this contrast between Salka's nerdy bookishness and Falco's more rugged, industrially oriented masculinity brings to mind a really prescient quote uh, from the memoirs of the Muscillic author Good Lombard Katz Nelson. So Katz Nelson recalls that as a child, he loved to read from the Kava Yosher, and that like most bilingual Hebrew Yiddish texts, the Yiddish was printed on the bottom half of the page with the Hebrew original on the top half. And the Yiddish was much easier for Katz Nelson to understand, but he writes that, quote, when one of my uncles explained to me that it was unbecoming for a male to read books in Yiddish, which were intended only for women, I began with great effort to climb up from below the margin. So there's clearly a lot that we could talk about here with regard to the way that gender is being constructed in this quote, but I unfortunately don't have the time to flesh that out. Um, but we can see from the imagery uh, of climbing up from the margin is really powerful. Um, and it's interesting to think about how when Salka is reading his copy of the Kapo Yosher, uh, he's really reorienting himself towards the margins. Um, Salka has been educated in a rapidly secularizing world, and we can assume that his Hebrew reading knowledge is probably minimal compared to his Yiddish. So when he reads Kavha Yosher, he is training his eyes towards the parts of the page that are deemed less sophisticated, less masculine, and less powerful. The other thing that I want to keep in mind here is that when Salka is reading from the margins, his pages are surrounded in the screen edge mold. So the margins, the edges of the pages, are the parts that are most exposed to air and moisture and are going to be the first sections of the book to start to rot. So the margins become this place both figuratively and literally where we're seeing a collection of material that's considered to be corruptive or contaminative. Um, the Yiddish language margins are the place where the mildew is congregating and it's also the place where the male reader's gender is being threatened or challenged. And while we're thinking about gender, along with the Kav Yosher, one of the books that Salka spends a lot of time with is the Tzenarena, which is maybe the most widely, widely read work of uh, early modern Yiddish literature. The Tzenarena has been published continuously since the 16th century, and we usually talk about it as a translation of the Bible into Yiddish for readers who couldn't understand Hebrew, with the cliche being that it was a book for women and men who are like women, meaning men who couldn't read Hebrew. The reality of what is in this book and who read it and why is a lot more complicated, but certainly by the time that Zalman Yanner takes place, that Santa Rena is something that's associated with old, pious Jewish women. In the novel, Tzalka finds an old copy of the Santa Rena somewhere around the house, and after deducing the year and the location of its printing, quote, he squandered away the night while bent over an old Santa Rena, communing with the souls of deceased Jewesses. So here, the age of the book and the hands that it has passed through enhance its spiritual qualities. Salka is able to imagine and access these deceased Jewish women because of the way that his Senarena has physically aged and deteriorated. We can assume that, like the trinus on the top shelf of the family bookcase, this Senarena is beginning to rot away. But as it does, it undergoes a transformation that contextualizes it in its historical period. I like to think of the fungal mycological alterations that happen to these books as a kind of temporal graffiti. Um, there are these patterns of moldy intrusions that are scrawled into the edges of the pages um, without the permission of the reader, the publisher, or the printer. And like street graffiti, they're doing a lot of the work that allows us to get to know a place and the people that inhabit it. Those fungi are the markers of age and antiquity that enabled Salka to reconnect with his Jewish female ancestors. It's the sensorial aspects of the book, the way that it smells, feels, and looks that are the things that let him know that he's going back in time when he picks it up. So let's talk about what mold can teach us as people who work with Jewish history. It feels a little weird to refer to fungi as trendy, but there's definitely been a lot of excitement around new ways of thinking about fungal life. 
We can see it in popular academia with books like Anand Singh's The Mushroom at the End of the World, in pop culture with documentaries like Fantastic Fungi, or in the spike in general interest in psilocybin mushrooms as a form of psychotherapy. Mushrooms are having a huge moment in the fashion and culinary worlds, and new research on medicinal uses of fungi continues to capture public attention. But it seems like this mycological turn has passed Jewish studies by up until now. In fact, despite the increasing prominence of ecocritical approaches in cultural history research and the literary humanities, Jewish studies as a discipline has remained largely preoccupied with an idea of the human as the sole agent of Jewish history. However, there are some popular works that point towards a growing hunger for engagement with the relationship between Jewish humans and their non-human biological environments. There's the success of the 2021 Ashkenazi herbalism, as well as Geraldine Brooks's novel, People of the Book, which uses a fictionalized biochemical analysis to explore the history of the Sarajevo Haggadah. Uh, a new work looking at the ethnobotany of Jewish cemeteries or at the Jewish experiences of viruses like cholera and tuberculosis has shown a slow turn towards thinking about the interplay between Jewish human and more than non-human, more than human rather life forms. Um, but I feel like applying a fungal lens to Yiddish literature is still a mostly untapped market. Fungi have historically been coded as antithetical to the aesthetics of modernity in the Eurocolonial world. They're dirty, poisonous, and infectious. But this new excitement around the biological complexity and ecological importance of mushrooms and other fungal species has led to a renewed appreciation for the ways that fungi can illuminate connections whether through the use of psilocybin mushrooms to regenerate neural pathways in patients suffering from clinical depression, or through the study of mycelium, the root structure that fungi use to transmit electricity and share information. And in Zelman Yanner, the spaces that fungi inhabit are the spaces that have been excluded from the cultural and aesthetic future of the Soviet Union. They live in the corners of Yiddish language religious texts that will never be reprinted and will not be protected in the archive. And still, by making their home in the pages of these books, they exercise their power to connect their readers to an imagined past, as Tolka does when he finds himself in communion with the souls of the women who read the Tzadarena before him. What I think is really particularly notable is the way that these moldy Yiddish texts are themselves all works of commentary. The Tzadarena is sometimes misunderstood as being a translation of the Hebrew Bible, when in actuality, what makes it such a success are the Yiddish language exegetical passages that accompany direct quotations from the Hebrew. The Tzenarena is an assemblage of Mephorshim, works of commentary on the central biblical writings. And these Mephorshim are found in the blocks of text that line the margins of a page of Talmud or a section of the Torah. I would argue that the mold on the pages that Salka reads are themselves works of commentary. They recontextualize these volumes as archaic or as fragile relics of a dying history. And perhaps more importantly, they bring the non-human into focus. It becomes very clear that microbial life has an active role in shaping the way that we think about Jewish history because its presence on the page affects the way that we experience Jewish literature. For a culture where books are so central in the networks of cultural transmission, it's critical that we think about the role that other than human organisms play when it comes to how we discover our own material literary heritage. The mildew and other organisms that find a home in their pages become part of how the text is read, finding a way to write back against their own erasure. This is where I think the framing of a kind of fungal graffiti is really useful. It lets us think not just of matter out of place, but also of text out of place. The marginality of the mold in books like the Tzanarena and the Kapha Yosher mirrors the marginality of its readers. As women, as men from families too poor to afford Hebrew education, as Jews in quote unquote Christian Europe, the margin is not an unfamiliar place. Anti-Semitic ideology has long cast Jews as a noxious and invasive biological other, and in certain cases has even directly compared Jewish people to poison mushrooms, like in this Nazi-era children's book, Der Gift Pits. But by rethinking how we look at mold, mildew, and other forms of life that are found in abandoned and undesired places, we might be able to better understand our own historical marginality. If the mold that's situated peripherally on the page can be understood as a critical evaluation of the text in its place in history and time, we might begin to think more generously about the fungal nature of Ashkenazi Jewish history. Yiddish culture grows out of a state of perpetual marginality and displacement that is at the same time undeniably integrated into wherever it finds itself at that moment. That's the paradox of Doikite. And like mushrooms in a forest or spots of mildew on a sheet of parchment, Yiddish grows in clusters rather than in fields. And the mycelium networks below the soil are their own kind of verbindungen. 
Solka's reading practice in Zelmanyan offers us some good guidance as scholars and enthusiasts of Yiddish literature. When we use books from another time as a point of entry into Jewish history, we would do better to pay attention to the greenish marginal mildew and consider the ways it colors the stories we take in. 